Cover a lot of little things, show you some good, some bad, some do's, some don'ts. But hopefully, show you for those of you that don't know, I'm scared to try how to make some place masking napkins and using the table saw and the drill press. The uh, these are the place mats that I'm going to show you how to make. Even though I'm showing you this, you can make place mats out of solid cherry, solid walnut. Any kind of wood you want to make, I'm just showing you a procedure that I use. And this is not the only thing you can do. When I first saw this design in Wood Magazine, oh, I guess it's been 30 years ago, it had this design on one end, and it was just plain cherry all the way over. But they had rounded it on the corner, and they had done the corners on a bandsaw. And I just couldn't see how all of that's going to be smooth. So I tried doing it like that, and I didn't like it. I wind up doing designs on both ends, and I said, well, let me see if I can cut these on the table saw. And all I did was sandwich two pieces of plywood between it, and I had to put a piece up under here, you know, um, some runners so that my clamps, you know, would sit up and not ride on the table. And it looked pretty good, so then I made a jig, which I'll show you how to use it. Uh, you know, to trim all my placemats. So that's where I do all my placemats. And I'm going to actually put one together. And I'll show you some of the do's and don'ts. Do we have the overhead camera? This is the way they start out. And what I'm going to show you if it shows up. Oh, you didn't have the monitor. Do these cracks show up pretty good? Yes, you're, you're all right. Above. When you rip strips, the one thing I do in my placemats is I'm looking at the inside of the wood that you're looking at for the face side. I don't use the wood grain that most people use in furniture and making boxes or whatever. The prettiest wood a lot of times is what's inside of the when you slice it. And so for that reason when you start ripping a lot of wood thin you can have the best equipment, you can rip it as straight as you can, but the thin it gets Sometimes the more you have curves and stuff happen to it. And if you try to, if you don't have, if you don't have some way to straighten them out, you'll wind up with a lot of, uh, where the two I put together? you wind up with a lot of cracks. And as I said, this is not a finished place mat. I'm not going to use it. I put this together so I could show you some things. These have obvious cracks. You have one piece that's curved this way, but what, once it's curved this way, if you make it, you know, sand it where it's straight, you also have the other end that's curved and it's going to create a different crack. So this will create a crack in the center. This will create a crack on the, each end. You understand where we're coming from? So if you look at this, this one here, there's a crack in the center. It's tight on the ends, but here, this same piece now it has a crack on both ends because it's curved. So I'm going to show you how to do that and the human eye really won't pick it up on most of the placemats. And the way we do this is if this is a big crack. Everybody see that? Alright, we're going to close this crack up some and I'll show you how I wind up doing it. I got some 120 grit sandpaper stuck on the table and all I'll do is Normally I mark them. I need to show you the way I really do it rather than doing it. Normally I will mark it so that I put a mark here. That lets me know I need to sand from here to here. Everybody understand where we're coming from now? I'll do the same thing here. I start off marking it with an angle. That means everything from here to here gets sanded on this. I'll do the same thing on the other one first. And it doesn't take I don't have a complicated way I'm doing this. I 
normally I would pick two that has a little less extreme because I always cut a lot of extra strips. I'm not going to finish sanding it, but can you see how the crack is closed up a lot? And if I held this up, well, you can see it there, I'm sorry. The human eye really doesn't pick it, pick it up as good. So it doesn't matter whether this slat is a 60-fold narrower than the other one, or you can't pick up a 60-fold from that end to this end, so it still looks like it's a perfect mat. Everybody understand where we're coming from? All right, once I do that, what I wind up doing, I normally clamp this to my work table. When I'm putting my mats together, I have slats. And what I wind up doing is everything here is a square. It's going to fit square into my trimmer that I made. So as I lay my pattern down, this end is from bump to bump is square. This end here doesn't matter. I'm going to trim it all off anyway. All right. But what I want to be able to do is mix and match the woods. I don't want one mat to have a lot of sap wood in it. I love the sap wood because that creates a lot of pretty designs. But I want to make, when I'm making a set of four, if I'm making a set of six, I will put them all, lay them all out on the table and I'll mix and match the wood so that I got the same variations of colors in all four mats. The shades, the different textures or whatever the wood presents. Everybody understand that part? All right. Then I will run this goes, this is where I'm, I lay it out. I'm looking at the face side. This is going to be the face side of the mat when I get through. Once I get it where I want it, I will run a piece of masking tape down the center. If you pull it too tight, what's going to happen is it's going to pull it up. And if it does, just loosen the tape up, lay it down, and push it back down. But you don't want to pull it too tight because it's going to spring like an accordion. All right? Now, once I get all of them, I uh, put one here. I put one down each side. This is where I'm going to trim. The tape does two things. It holds this together while I'm putting the mastic on it to adhere uh, to the uh, vinyl. But it also helps some of the, the chip out as I'm trimming it on the saw. And when I get through, I just pull the whole thing off. Now, I got, I got certain dimensions I do for my mats. You can make the mats as wide as you want, as long as you want, any way you want to do it for your benefit. There's no certain way to say it has to be this dimension or that dimension. That's the main thing I want to... It's more than one way to do it. It's more than one size you can do. Normally in my shop, my fence, I move it over to this side. In this slot, let me move this first. You wonder what all these are, I'll tell you in a minute. My slot is on this side, and this is made to trim a mat a little wider than what I got here. I can make them a little, you know, an inch wider if I wanted to. So I made a bigger one here. Now what I wind up doing, this has vinyl already on it. It's not trimmed, but it's already secured. What I have to wind up doing is I have to have a piece on the end of plywood so that I support the wood up on the bottom. And it sticks out just about an eighth of an inch above where the saw is going to cut. All right? And since I'm using a single piece here, I have to have a, another piece here so it sits flat. All right? Now, all of my mats, the reason I use the square, Everything is squared up here, all right? Now, since this is not as wide, what I'm going to do, I'm doing it backwards because I'm trying to do it where you can see it. Number one, this piece sticks out just a little. I need to do these one at a time. Then I can get it where I want it. Yeah. 
I put this back in here because I want the back end all of them to be up against here now. I need those now, brothers. too much. <laughs> Since I'm doing this out, we're going to trim this. All right, one other thing that I do, I was making placemats and I had about 2,000 strips to rip one Christmas. There was no way I was going to move this fence every time and let it fall off the outside. I don't care what kind of jig you're using. I rip all of these pieces with my fence, with my blade about an eighth of an inch away from the fence. I started ripping the pieces now about 3 sixteenths rather than an inch. Because once I did an inch and you sand them a lot of times, they were a little too thin to me. All right, everybody follow where I'm going. You said an inch is too thin? No, no, eighth of an inch. <laughs> yeah. In other words, these used to be eighth of an inch. Now I rip them about three sixteenths. So they're a little thicker. So as I'm sanding, because I sand these with the belt sander. And as I sand, now I'm getting down close to eighth of an inch with the finished product. When I had started out with eighth of an inch, sometimes you had to sand more to get them all level and smooth across there, and it wound up to me being a little thin, thinner than I would normally have it. All right. Now, whatever, what we do in my shop, As I push, you notice the slide, I usually have my blade about an eighth of an inch above what I'm cutting, and no more than the bottom of the gullet of the saw blade. All right, this allows me now, with this push stick, as I push it out, as I cut it, the thin piece is being pushed out here on this side, and this pushes the other piece out. Now I rip, this is not ripped to that size, in my shop, I rip it so that I can get four or five rips because my blade is eighth of an inch and I used to rip an eighth of an inch. So if I did five eighths or three quarters or whatever it was, the last cut was the wood disappears. I didn't have a big piece of wood. And I, as you rip, as I rip freehanded like I'm doing, you will start to get just a little smidgen of a curve, but it's not enough to cause a problem. So as I made two rips this way, I turned it around with the straight side to make two rips. And everything was gone by then, so I didn't have any noticeable. Am I everybody clear on what I just said? All right. That's the way it worked for me. So as I was sizing these pieces, once I ran them through my joint, I'm playing them. <coughs> ran them through my plane to get this thickness size. Then I would rip them to the appropriate width that I wanted. So that when, as I ripped the saw, as I ripped, I didn't have to wind up trying to rip five times and all of a sudden that last piece did this. All right, they stay relatively straight and I could use it. This, as I say in my shop, this is made to where my fence is over here. So I'm gonna have to turn this around backwards because my this fence doesn't have enough room to lock when I push it over that way. thing fell right into that slot.
going to be great. Huh? No, it's all right. If it moved over a little bit more, it fell right into the slot. Now once we rip, turn it around where you can see what I'm doing. Can you see that all right? Once I do that, I've gotten all of these straight, okay? Now the other thing we're going to do is, I'm going to turn it around. Now I don't have to worry about it fitting up against here or here, being square. I've already squared this off. So I'm just going to make sure this is parallel. And the only thing I'm going to do now, depending on how much is overhanging here on the different slats, up with now is we got all of our uh, things trimmed to size all right I found this is the easiest way for me to do it what kind of what now Glue. oh it's h2o which is a water-based contact and let me tell you about the contact cement which is very important I first start doing these mats that was the stuff I think is still on the market. You spread out a can, this contact comes out like a little spider web. Oh, I loved it. I thought it was great. Made some mats with it. And the things, after a while, they fell apart. Couldn't figure it out. I went and bought some um, um, regular contact cement. This is a petroleum base. Made some mats, and they looked perfect. I sold some to two... two um, Places, one was in New Jersey and one was here. After about a month or two, people called me, said, you need to come look at these mats. They had fallen apart. And I didn't know what to do. So I stopped making place mats, I guess about a year maybe, somewhere along in there. And I tried to figure out what the reason was. So I went to a water-based contact, uh, Borden's, they make the glue to go in schools and all this stuff. They made a water-based contact. I loved it. But then they stopped making it. And the only thing you can find now I found was a little touch-up bottle they have. So I had to try to find another contact. This I get from Wilson Art, and it's called H2O. Um, I think on the Internet, well, it ranges from $48 to $55 a gallon for that size. Uh, but it's great. You're welcome to look at this. I made some, some samples. And if you notice, I got some dates on here. The earliest one is 2005. These are the pieces I was looking for to show you how to close up the holes. As I say, this is the face side. While I'm sanding one of these, I'll take the 
I'm going to pass some around so that you can see the differences of the, the textures in the inside of the wood and what it looks like if you only look in the wood grain. What I want you to look at when you do see this mat, and you'll see when I sand the other one, this is sapwood, but the sapwood has a lot of pretty texture it adds to the mat. All right. So all of these, what you're looking at here, all of the cherry, you're looking at the inside of the wood. Now on the Paduke, sometimes I can't tell the inside from the outside the way the grain runs on it. I don't like blood wood. I understand blood wood will stay red longer. I don't like the way it smells when I work with it. So I just don't use blood wood. But you can use blood wood if you want to make this design instead of Paduke or whatever you want to use. And as you notice, the only thing I've done here is once I rip my walnut to half an inch and the maple to a quarter of an inch, once you get flat pieces, you glue them, on, glue them together. Now I just slice off of it, and that's what creates this design here. Now I want you to notice one thing. It's not too evident and noticeable here, but this walnut is darker than that walnut. And that's what I try to do. Now if you look at this one, that's showing up pretty good, brother. If you look at this one, the shade on this wall and the shade is the same as this one because they came out of the same piece. So I try to mix and match, like I say, the same way I do the other things, I try to mix and match the colors of the walnut. I don't want one to be real dark and one to be real light. You know, then it still does, it, does, it look like a mix, mismatch. So I'm going to pass this one around. And this is just for while I'm sanding the mat, just for you look at the textures of the wood, and it makes a big difference in how it looks to me. <coughs> now I sand these with the belt sander. When I first got the idea of how I was going to sand these things, I had no idea whether this would work or not. I used to take the belt sander, the first one they ever made, I didn't have, I didn't spray lacquer on them, I used to put oil on them. I was scared to spray lacquer, I thought they would stick together. And I didn't really know how to spray lacquer good then. So as I did the belt sand, I sometimes run it this way and that way. They look good to me, but they, you can see the scratches in them from the ones I used to make from the ones I make now. I only sand these to 120 grit. I don't sand anything past 120 grit. My, all of my tools seem to be kind of wearing out of doing something to me now after 30 years. I tried mine belt sander yesterday and it started arcing fire. And I looked at it, I kind of took something loose and the brushes are just worn down, it's metal, <laughs> it's hitting metal now. So I borrowed this one that didn't have a uh, vacuum on it, so we got to make sure hold to close this up. That's why it looks like this. We had to do a little operating on it. And the only thing about doing the belt sander is I don't have to press with all of my weight I got one piece of Baduke here that's a little bit shorter. Will the camera pick this up? This one here? Yep. All right, the only thing I do is take all four of the mats, put them back in there, take this side and trim that. That's not quite an eighth of an inch, we trim them all out. All right, so as I say, you can make these as wide as you want, as long as you want. Uh, this is about the typical size of mine, I think I used to make them maybe a little bit wider because I, for this demonstration, I think I trimmed these, I made these a little smaller. But you can make it any size you want to make it. All I do is clamp down the board and I try to get one as thin as the, as the mats with my belt sander and I need it wide, wide enough so that as I bring my belt sander here, it won't hit my clamp. All right, I got a little room to work with. Now it's important, I know I'm to keep my hands straight and I move my body. That way I got control of this all the time. And the only thing you want to do, as I say, is I want to keep it moving this way with the grain of the, of the wood. Doing also, let me vacuum some of this off. So. 
the mat starting to feel pretty smooth, except I can see where I haven't gotten down right here. I can still see a little saw burn. But I want you to feel how smooth it is once I get through with just 120 grit sanding. All right, I don't have to do a lot of sanding here, but I can sand it some more, but this will wind up. You can always hold it up to where you can see a little light reflecting off of it and see if you got any deep scratches. All right, you learn, I've learned to, even though a lot of stuff I make sometimes I can show you every flaw in it, but I, I've learned how to finish the finish and not try to finish the wood. All right, I was saying my, my finish at 320 once I put the sanding seal on it. You can feel what you can't see. All right, while I got this here, let me show you one other thing. I want you to feel, you need to feel it on a flat surface. Or if you get it out there, hold it so you can kind of feel how smooth it's got. And that's just with the 120 grit paper. When I, I glued up a little bit to show you how, once I align this over my, my vinyl, what I wind up doing is I make sure the vinyl is cut wide, big enough so that I got excess all the way around. Once I put, if I'm, when I put vinyl, when I put the mastic on it, I turn these over because I still have the tape on them so that way I know I'm gluing the right side. So as I turn them over, I got the mat here and the vinyl here or the mat here and the vinyl here. And I use Tell you a story about the vinyl, remember this. This is a foam roller, small one. I think I've used this and it was okay, but I'm not positive, so I don't use it anymore. It, it works faster, but I'm not sure if, if all of this foam, depending on who you get it from, whether it will make the mastic, it does something to the mastic if it's a petroleum-based product. All right. I only use the natural bristle brushes. These little things, you can buy them a dollar piece or whatever at Home Depot Lowe's. And it takes a little longer, but this stuff is real thin. It doesn't take that long to put a thin coat, you know, a mastic on here and a thin coat on here. I basically go with the, with the grains of the wood by putting thin coats. I minimize the amount that gets down in the grooves, you know, the mastic. Once I put a thin coat here and a thin coat there and they dry, when I can touch it with my finger and it doesn't feel wet and sticky and doesn't stick to my finger, I can go ahead and put the second coat on. Once it dries for the first coat, I put the second coat on. Once I put the second coat on and it dries, now what I do is I have to turn these over. But remember the contact, if it touches, you can't move it. It's not like glue where you can reposition it. So. I usually use quarter inch dowels or uh, something that's a bit larger. These work fine for what I'm doing now. I mean, I've done it so much. Lay down there. As I position this, I make sure I got my hand on the vinyl. I'm making sure I got vinyl all the way around the outside of the mat, okay, before I sit it down. And with the tape on it, it's pretty rigid. It doesn't bend like this. So you don't have to worry about the end flopping down and touching right away. Now what I wind up doing now is, as I pull one of these out, I will make contact with the ends. Now once the end is stuck, I will roll it this way. As I roll it to where it's sticking, I pull this one out and I roll it some more and I pull the next one out. You don't need maybe as many as I got in here, but I had them cut, so I just brought them. <coughs> all right, so what I'm doing is now I'm up making sure it's a hearing all the way, you know, I'm getting contact all the way down. Now, I don't pull the last one out yet. Before I pull the last one out, I put my finger here because I don't want it to touch kind of like that or whatever. All right, so and I, once I get it here, I flip it over. 
and you can't use a uh, press like this because you're going to hit bump to bump to bump. There are going to be some places that's not stuck because you haven't put pressure on them. So what I use is, this is a caster. I've been using this one for 30 some years. I probably used it at least 20 years before they ever got pad on. I used to just put it between my fingers, <laughs> okay? I was doing a class and one of the students uh, told me you need to make a thing with that. So he made a little thing and put it on here. Uh, but this allows me to roll every single slat and get a good feel. And what I do is I make sure, this is before it's ever cut, I make sure that, I'll well, put this back over you can see better. I make sure that I roll the edges. I want to make sure it's stuck tickle on these edges all the way around. When I get through, and I roll it several times, and if you ever looked at them, I don't care how you cut them perfectly one time, some wood swells more than others, expands more than others, so you're still going to get a feel on the back. So if I don't do what I'm doing, I won't get a good adhesion all the way around. And if something happens, uh, sometimes you have to work with a spot that you get a little bubble in it or whatever. You have to take the exacto knife and kind of make a little slit to get the air out of it while it's still fresh enough to stick down and then press it down again. Because if you ever get a little air bubble stuck in there, it's stuck in there. But you can get rid of it by just making some little part places. Now basically what I've done now is some of these were a little thicker than others because I think I had to grab some extra, I see one here that's thinner. I didn't have enough pieces to make the four mats and some of them were rejects but I had to put it in. I said well let's sand down. The top is fine but I can look at one right here where this one is a smaller piece. All right, But if I didn't roll it like I did this would not be stuck. And so if that happens, as long as this is, is flat, it's fine. So I'm going to pass this one around, but just look at the texture of, you know, looking at the inside of the wood and what it adds to the mat versus looking at just the end, you know, the outside edge of what you would normally see. Uh, and is that an upholstery material that you're doing? Yeah, this is, uh, there's a bunch of wholesale upholstery places in Atlanta around Huff Road. Uh, the old water, Atlanta Water Works over that way. And uh, on Huff Road, there's a lot of places, and you buy this stuff. Now, it comes in, uh, the sheets are 55 inches wide. I'm going to give everybody a cutting diagram of how you efficiently cut it if you happen to buy it. You can go anywhere and buy it, and I got some samples of what, what kind to get and what kind not to get. You can use, I guess you can. I guess it's called Naga High. I just call it vinyl. Uh, if you look here, believe it or not, these show up in the, in the book, depending on where you went, as the same pattern, same color scheme, but they're totally different. All right? So, particularly these two. There's one that you don't want to buy. I don't know if I got it or not. One is, uh, this is a, it has kind of a foam-like backing on it, like cotton or something. Is that uh, there, yeah. Yeah. Not only is it kind of a foam, but it's real flimsy. And what it will do is it will allow your mat to stretch a little bit more and it doesn't look as rigid and as good. So I'll pass all these around. I'm going to show you, even in the black, you got two different textures in the black, and particularly with these two, I know these two are the same identical pattern in the book, but they're totally different. One is prettier. I like both of them. It doesn't matter which one I had gotten. So, uh, excuse me, much, I mean, it's the bottom. It depends on what you want. It doesn't matter. I'm just showing you uh, some samples of what you can buy. And like I said, it comes in a the rows of 55 inches across. And it comes in a row, you buy however many feet you need to get. Um, any questions on that so You're far? Saying the one not to get is the one that has the foam? The, the one that has kind of a foam feeling to it, a cotton feeling I call it, it's thinner. You'll, you'll feel the difference in it. Oh, okay. 
I don't trust it as good. I don't think it looks as good. I think I did do a mat, a test piece with it once or something. I didn't like it. Okay. Now, it doesn't mean that these are the kind you have to get. These are the ones I've used it over the years, and this is what I like. And so you pick the patterns you want. Now, I'm going to show you one other thing. I brought some... I, try, I used to try a lot of different designs. This had some little bird side things I thought would be pretty. I didn't like it as good as what I make. So I only make the one I got now. There's another thing. This was a pretty mat, but what happened is the, the uh, when I had them stacked, I had them stacked on top of each other. And for some reason, they hadn't cured yet. They were dry. I thought they had cured enough. So when I got ready to separate them, part of the finish had dissolved and stuck to the other mat. So I bring it to show you what not to do. And the other thing is, you notice how the end on this curls? Everybody see that? Yeah. That's if, when I, when I did the thing in the beginning, if I pulled it too tight, you understand what I'm saying? Everything didn't lie flat, then that happens. Now some of this could have happened also I don't think it was pulled as tight, but I think some, some of this happened as the wood swole. Uh, it expanded. It expanded this way, so it expanded more than the vinyl expanded. Everybody understand what I'm saying? So I started making mats to where I didn't try to close up all the cracks real tight. You know, there were acceptable cracks I could leave in there. There were acceptable cracks, I mean, cracks you didn't want to leave in there. So that I tried to allow for a little bit of the expansion so that wouldn't happen, all right? But all of these are some I've done when I was doing different classes. Some of these mats go back for years, and I, you can look at some, they're real thin, uh, but you're welcome to look at them, and I just brought them as a sample. Now this one, look at this mat, look at the one I passed around. I keep moving it, but I'll show you. All right, this one is not as pretty with the cherry. You don't have the same designs because the cherry I had then didn't have all the characteristics as the one I'm passing around. So look at, look at the cherry here and look at the cherry and the one I'm passing around. That's a prettier mat to me. All right, plus now this one is thinner uh, the way I used to make them. And sometimes you had to sand them more and they'd be thinner than what I wanted them to be. There's nothing wrong with it. Yeah, do they, do they have any, what, what about cleaning these things? All right, I'll get to that. Okay. When I first started making the mats, I wasn't sure. I thought if I sprayed lac on them, that uh, they would stick together and get all down the cracks. Uh, I had done some, I had sold some. I think I had eight of them I made for a couple good friends of mine. And... They were using them for a dinner party. They used to have a lot of high-end dinner parties. And she called me a little after that and uh, said, I need to come by and look at the mats. <laughs> I went by, and that's when I was just putting oil on them. Well, as she was kept wiping them with the wet rags and stuff when they got through, they looked horrible. So I got a friend of mine, David McDonald. You heard me mention him a lot of time. I called David. I went and picked all the mats up. I called David. I said, David... <laughs> I need to come out and you can show me what I need to do with those mats. And uh, we sanded them down, cleaned them off, and David sprayed the lac on them. And I was just amazed. It, you sprayed the thin coats, of, it's thin coats you need to spray. He sprayed thin coats of sanding silo, and I sanded in between each one. When I sprayed the lac on there, uh, the first coat of lacquer just jumps out at you. And then I don't. I sprayed the second coat of lacquer. Once it dried, we did this the same day. It wasn't cured. It was just dry enough to mess with. And I took some four alt steel wool and just kind of buffed the lacquer down to get rid of any little nubs, anything you felt on it. It's a different feel. Now this mat right here, I don't know how long ago it's been sanded, but it's still pretty smooth. And this is still sanded with 120 grit. But I marked some cracks on here. You see the arrows. I marked, you can't see them. Uh, some of these are not acceptable. This is not an acceptable crack. You have some other small cracks that you can leave. I mean, I leave. 
So, you see what I'm looking at now? But it's up to you as to what you want. This is the only thing I can control whatever I want to do with these. If somebody like them, they like them. If they don't like them, they don't like them. But you don't want big cracks that will allow a lot of food stuff to get down in there. And once you spray lacquer on it, uh, you just take a damp rag when you use them and wipe them off. Now, as I'm spraying lacquer, the one thing I do do is as I'm spraying the first coat of sanding sealer, I will actually hit the edges lightly. All right. And as I spray the first coat of lacquer, I will hit the, I want to put a little finish all the way around here. I don't want a lot of finish because I'm scared it might start reacting with the vinyl. But I want to seal the wood somewhat. And this one here has been sanded a lot. It's real thin. Uh, but all of these, I just want you to feel them. They don't have any finish on them at all. And all they've been done, all I've done to them is sanded them. And like I say, some of these have been sanded years ago. And I just want you to see how smooth. They've only been sanded 120 grit. The only reason I know that because that's all I sand to. All right. You can sand the 220, whatever you want to sand to is fine. Uh, the other thing I want to show you, let me get my exacto knife. This to me is very important. I'm going to trim the edges so they're going to be pretty smooth. What I want to make sure I do is the ends. When I cut the vinyl off, I'm not going to sand these ends. If you sand them, what you're going to wind up doing is you're going to sand the edges of the vinyl and make it rough instead of being fairly smooth. Everybody understand where I'm coming from? The saw blade is going to make it kind of smooth here. My X-Acto knife is going to make it smooth on the ends. You know, words, as I cut it off, this is a mat. So this is what I'm cutting off with the X-Acto knife. And so I'm going to cut this one to show you how I do it. But what happened with this, this is the end I cut with the X-Acto knife. I'm not doing anything else to these ends and this end. Now you might get a little... Uh, you might get a little uh, contact cement on here, but if you kind of rub it, you can rub all that little contact cement off. Everybody understand where I'm coming from? Because I don't want to do anything to this edge. I want it to stay as smooth and natural. And I try to make sure that pieces of Paduke or whatever you use on the ends, that it's pretty smooth in the beginning, the end pieces, because you're not going to do anything else to them. And what I've found that I do, you can do it any way you want to do it, because as I say, I try to make sure that everybody understands there's more than one way to do anything you do. I'm just showing you some of the ways I do it. So there's, there are a lot of ways there's no right and wrong way, you know, to do it, except I'll try to let you know any pitfalls I've had in the, in the past. Now, what I will wind up doing, does this show up good, Buzz? I will start a little past the edge. I press my X-Acto knife against it. Now my knife is flexing a little bit. Can you see that? So as it flexes, I'm using the ends as my guide so that when I get through, this is cut off exactly smooth with the ends. Everybody see that? All right, now on this end, I mean, that's not the end I'm cutting. I'm, I'm doing this backwards because this is a small thing. This is the edge I'm cutting. I'm cutting this edge and this edge. So what I wind up doing, I put my X-Acto knife against here and it is tight against there, which keeps it tight, but it's flexing a little bit. That's showing up? All right. As I come down, now that gives me my straight, straight edge here. All right. Now on this end, these are the ones I'm gonna trim. All I'm doing is taking some of the excess off so it doesn't matter, all right? It doesn't matter about trying to be flush with them because I'm going to trim all these anyway. Is that clear? But these are the two ends that I'm going to, and that's all it takes to trim those ends. So I'm not doing anything else to these ends except spraying a little bit of stuff. Is that okay? All right. I've shown you how I sand them, how I put them together. 
Uh, now we're gonna do a napkin ring. Question. Sure. Uh, belt sander versus orbital sander. All right. Random orbital sander works fine on a lot of stuff. I got one. I very seldom use it because most of the things I use uh, are small. This is probably the biggest thing I could use one on. You can use a random orbital sander. I just found this keeps it flat. With a random orbital sander, I got, you got to make sure that you don't get your swirl marks because you're dealing with a different thing than a solid piece of wood. So I don't, I have no idea, no problem with it. It's just that I started out using the belt sander and I just perfected how I use it so it, I don't have any problem. Any other questions? Now, like I say, you can say with higher grits than what I sand to. Uh, I don't like sanding, so I found that most of the things I make, I can do 120 grit, and I can get stuff pretty smooth. Even with this, I can go to my finish sander. I use this most. I got two of them. I got a porter cable, and I got this <laughs> Makita. My porter cable, both of them, I've dropped them so much or whatever, I got to put new bases on them. But after 30 years, they have, with all the stuff I've sanded, they have served me well. I have no problem. Okay. Uh, Excuse me. About how much do you sell them for? All right. I started out, place match was $60 a piece. The napkin rings were $40 a piece. I tried to keep it at $100. Now, place match is $100 a piece. The napkin rings, I still keep them about $70. And people want them good. They don't want them. I don't have a problem. And I still think that's cheap. <laughs> When you, uh, seriously, when you start buying the wood, the price of wood and stuff now has gone up. Any other question? All right. With that, I guess we're through, Buzz. All right. Here we go. All right.